Good to see you in church tonight. Beautiful Wednesday evening. Glad you're here. Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10, verse number 1 says, When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Father, we ask you to add your blessing now to the Reading of our scripture tonight and the other scriptures we'll look at this evening, Lord, as we uh, study, we begin to study the lives of these twelve that you chose, that they might be with you and that you would send them forth to preach. These men who the testimony was, they've turned the world upside down. And Lord, I pray that as we just lay the groundwork for that tonight, we would you would whet our appetites to know these men, to learn about them, and to uh, be inspired by their example. So bless our study of your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I remember very well in uh, high school, I went to public high school, didn't go to Christian school, and uh, remember walking into a classroom, I'm guessing there'd have been 30 30 or 40 guys in that classroom, and it was a Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting. And I remember and uh, had one of those uh, clips, you know, that had a magnet on it, and a guy stuck that on the, the board up front, and he clipped in that clip a $100 bill. And he said, there's a $100 bill for any of you that can name for me the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Well, I'll, I'll t- I won't give it away, but I'll tell you, when the meeting was over, he took the $100 bill with him. If I tonight had a $100 bill, and I don't, and told you to name who here could name me the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, 
Now, maybe some of the children could because they learned a song, I think, that had the 12 disciples. Is that what you're doing, Mrs. Yoder, right now, singing that song? Yeah, she's, then you might, can you do it? I won't put you on the spot. I won't have you do it. But uh, there's, there were 12 disciples. Jesus called to help him. That's all I know. <laughs> so that doesn't help me. All right. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James's brother, John, something like that, right? Okay, and uh, then I'm lost. So I, I didn't know that song in high school either. Uh, I, think, I think I got about nine, but I, could, I listened three and couldn't get them, and it was, it was tough. Dave could name them? Okay, he names the starting lineup of the disciples. And, uh, and, and by the way, it was a shame because if you'd asked me to name off the nine guys who started for the Indians, I could have named them. And the starting lineup for the Cavaliers, I could name them. Well, how come I couldn't name Jesus' starting lineup, you know? Uh, I should know them. So most people, not only can we not name them, but probably we know even less about them and what they did. And so we're going we're gonna to learn about these men. And these men were not men of perfect character. They, each one of them had faults and failings. Peter cursed and swore, denying even knew the Lord. Thomas had doubts about Jesus after his resurrection. Matthew was a tax collector. Don't have to say much more than that. I mean, he worked for the IRS, okay? He was a, with the Roman authorities. James and John, they just wanted to call fire down on their enemies and have them burn up. Judas Iscariot, we know what a deceitful and scheming person he was and eventually betrayed the Lord Jesus. None of the disciples held a high position in society. None belonged to the Pharisees or the Sadducees. None of them were known for scholarship or for learning. There were no great orators or no theologians. They really were outsiders as far as the religious establishment was concerned. They were not chosen by Jesus because of any natural talent or intellectual ability. They were all prone to mistakes, misstatements, and wrong attitudes. Jesus even had to upbraid them once about how slow they were to catch on, how slow they were to learn and believe what He had taught them. The disciples are listed four times in the New Testament. The first time is here in Matthew 10. They're listed in Mark and Mark 3 in verses 16 through 19. I think these are on your paper, are they not? Luke 6, 14 through 16, and then Acts 1 and verse 13. Now, you can break the 12 apostles, 12 disciples, into three groups of four names each. Peter always leads the first group. In fact, he always leads the list. Okay. Philip always leads the second group of names. The second grouping of four. James, the son of Alphaeus, always leads the third group in every one of the listings. Now, you should remember as you read through that several of the disciples had more than one name. In fact, start with the easy one. Simon, he surnamed Peter. So, Simon, Peter. Judas the son of James, was also called Lebius or Thaddeus. You should know Simon the Zealot and Simon the Canaanite are the same guy. So when it says Simon the Canaanite or Simon the Zealot, same person. The other name for Matthew was what, church? Levi. Bartholomew is also Nathaniel, the Nathaniel from John chapter 1, who got saved. And Thomas was sometimes called Didymus. And Didymus, only, all it means is twin. We'll say more about that when we come to study Thomas. Okay? So there were two disciples named Simon. That's Simon Peter and Simon the Zealot, or Simon Zelotes, as they say. 
Two were named James. James, the son of Zebedee, and James, the son of Alphaeus. Two were named Judas. Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Sometimes uh, the other one was known as Judas, not Iscariot, to make sure that he wouldn't get confused with that guy. It's interesting, there were three sets of brothers chosen of the twelve. We know that Peter and Andrew were brothers. James and John were brothers. And Judas and James were, uh, James of Alphaeus, Judas, not Iscariot, were, were brothers. Luke 6 and verse 16. When you think about these 12 men, one of them was a political zealot, Simon the Zealot. It was a real political group that really wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And, and, and probably he thought Jesus was there to do that. One was a tax collector, it was Matthew. Four were fishermen. Possibly they think as many as seven might have been in the fishing business. Others were just tradesmen or craftsmen. It doesn't tell us what their profession was. But considering all the different backgrounds, all the different occupations, all the different personalities, that these men could be molded into one unit, is a, it, it, it's a testimony to the power of Jesus Christ. That he could transform these men to, to work together. It, was, it would be these men who are going to carry on the ministry of Jesus once he goes back to heaven. I don't know if Jesus ever looked at these twelve and looked at them and thought, wow, <laughs> wow, I'm going to leave everything to these guys. But it was those men that left an unforgettable impression upon this world. The twelve apostles of Jesus Christ. God empowered these men to spread the gospel to the world. Twelve men, especially chosen by Christ, and known by their Creator as only He could know them, yet chosen by Him. The propagation of the gospel, the founding of the church of Jesus Christ, it, it rested entirely upon these 12 men. And their most outstanding characteristic was they were ordinary. They were just ordinary guys. Chosen by Christ and trained personally by Him, for a time, by the way, that's best measured in months, not years. Jesus taught them how to live godly. He taught them how to pray. He taught them how to forgive one another. He taught them how to serve one another. He employed them as His ministers to heal the sick, to cast out devils, to do other miraculous works. It was a brief but very intense time of discipleship. And when it was over, on the night he was betrayed, they all forsook him and fled. I'm sure from an earthly viewpoint, if we'd have been observing that, we'd have thought, well, that training sure failed. <laughs> they all gave up and ran away. They, it seemed like they forgot and ignored everything Jesus taught them. For those, for those, for those days that he was in the grave, they kind of locked themselves in the upper room and didn't tell them. I, don't th I think they didn't tell anybody where they were. Why? I think they were afraid they were coming for them next. And so they were hiding out. But when they were encouraged by the risen Lord, when they saw Jesus had risen from the dead, and then at Pentecost, as they're empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, they begin to do the work that Jesus called them to do. And that work continues 2,000 years later. Right here with Bible Baptist Church and other churches of like faith. 
Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus' ministry, from the time he was baptized by John in the Jordan to the time of his resurrection, was just three years. That's all. One thing that you don't know, it probably, is that the training of the 12 disciples was only about half that time. Jesus did not call his disciples at the beginning of his ministry. He was about halfway through when he called the disciples. They had maybe 18 months with him. By the time he appointed these 12 that we read in Matthew 10, half of Jesus' earthly ministry was over. Up to that point, you know what Jesus had done? He had begun his ministry, but he did it by himself. He did it single-handedly. But the crowds had grown, the followers had increased, and now he must have help. And so he chooses 12 to be with him at all times and in all places. Look over in the Gospel of Mark, would you? You're in Matthew, just go to your right. The next book is Mark. Mark chapter 3. In Mark 3, in verse number 13, the Bible says, He goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And then again, you have the list as given in the other places. Twelve. Twelve is an important number. Twelve in the Bible. It, it comes, by the way, twelve tribes of Israel. And there are twelve tribes of Israel because they were twelve sons of Jacob. They became the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus told the twelve disciples that one day they'll sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes. There's twelve gates in the New Jerusalem containing twelve pearls. And even after the ascension that Jesus went up to heaven, the eleven were in the upper room with the 120 as part of the 120 and yet they, they felt the need not to leave the disciples at 11. They felt like they needed to get back to 12. And so they did the, the, the praying, and they asked God to cast the lot, and it fell upon Matthias. And Matthias then became the 12th. Now, Paul became an apostle, as he said, as one born out of due time. And uh, he's not included in that number. He had a kind of a special plan that God had for him. So these men, these 12, as we'll call them, had a little more than 18 months training for the monumental task they're going to be called to do. And understand, there's no second string. There's no plan B. They're it. But Jesus knew what he was doing. You see, their success would be dependent on them relying on the Holy Spirit of God to help them. It would not be in their power or their talent or their abilities. If anything would happen with these guys, with these twelve, the people would have to say, that's God. That's God. It can't be these guys. They're ignorant and unlearned men. And yet they turn the world upside down. And listen, when, when God does something great through ordinary people, through people who the world would look at and say, man, you're just foolish, then God gets the glory, God gets the credit, all the praise and all the honor goes to Him. We can't take credit for anything. I don't, I don't think it's good when we look at someone who has a, has a great personality or they have a following or they're famous and we say, boy, if that guy gets saved or if that girl gets saved, boy, they'd really do something for God. Probably not. Probably not. God never took people like that. God always took people that 
Everybody looked and said, that guy? <laughs> Him? They couldn't believe it. These men were merely instruments in God's hand. And God delights to use ordinary people. You and I can be instruments in God's hand. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Would you go there? Go after Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You have Acts. You have Romans. And then you'll come to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And you remember the church of Corinth. They were, they, they, they were a carnal church. What does carnal mean? Fleshly. All right? Which means they were proud. They had an eye problem. Okay? And I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Jesus. You know, they, they were fighting and arguing, had little factions in the church depending on who they liked for a preacher. And so Paul is trying to help them understand just exactly who they are. And notice verse number 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why did God choose things that are uh, uh, foolish and weak and base and despised? God chose those things to, to turn the world upside down. You know why? Because verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Nobody can say, look what I did. Look what I can do. No, no, no. Look what God can do. Look what God can do through an ordinary guy like me where nobody thought could do anything. You see? And uh, that's what God loves to do. He loves to use foolish things to confound the mighty. Sometimes the disciples... They were called disciples. A disciple is a learner or a student. Disciple, learner, student. Sometimes they were called apostles. An apostle is a messenger or a sent one. And they were sent out by our Lord with His authority. That's why before he sent them out in Matthew 28, he didn't just say, go ye into all the world, or go ye therefore and teach all nations. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. He's going in his authority. Going, we go out to preach the gospel. We go out to tell others the gospel of Christ. And listen, we're going out when someone says, uh, hey, it's none of your business. You guys say, no, it is my business. Because I've been sent on this business. You see, the Lord Jesus has commanded me to go. I tell people sometimes when they want to say, if you ask them if they're a Christian or if they've ever accepted Christ, and they say, uh, that's a private matter. And, and I say, well, I don't want to disagree with you, but it's not a private matter. It's a personal matter, but it's not a private matter. You must know Christ personally, but it's not private because Jesus told me and commanded me to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single person. I don't call him a creature. I call him a person. And, and as every single person, that would be you. So I'm commanded to preach the gospel to you. So it's personal, but it's not private. It's like when the fellow who said D.L. Moody witnessed to me last night and his friend said, why didn't you tell him to mind his own business? And the friend said, seemed like it was his business. And that's the way it ought to be when we give it the gospel. It ought to be our business. Uh, they're, they're sent ones, and they were sent out by the Lord Jesus. Luke uses the term apostle exclusively. Luke never refers to them as disciples, either in Luke or in the book of Acts. He always uses the word apostles. Mark and Matthew each use that term apostle once. And Mark often employed the term simply the twelve. 
in reference to the disciples. Now, the role of an apostle <coughs> involved the position of leadership in the early church. They were very, very much respected and, and listened to. In fact, you understand all of the New Testament, because Paul was an apostle born out of due time, all the New Testament was written by apostles, are close friends of an apostle. All 27 books. In, in Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, when the 3,000 were saved and were baptized, do you remember verse number 41 of Acts 2? Uh, verse 42, rather, after they were added, to the church, added unto them, the church, 3,000 souls. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. See, the apostles' teaching. That's how highly respected they were. They, were. they were leaders in the early church. God had given them the ability, supernatural power, to work signs and wonders, to give authority to their message, that their message truly was from God. They received that from Christ Himself. And they, they needed that. There was, there was no written Word of God. Later on, you remember the rich man in hell when he wanted um, uh, Abraham to send someone to my father's house. In fact, uh, he wanted to send Lazarus to my father's house, I think. Get him out of hell. Man, if somebody raises from the dead, if somebody come from hell, I don't want them to come here. And by the way, there's a great truth there. Nobody in hell wants anyone else to come there. Don't, no, somebody says, oh, I'll go to hell, all my friends are there. Yeah, they don't want you. They don't want you to come to that place of torment. And they, want, they were begging, they were, he was begging. People in hell are crying out for somebody to go to my father's house, knock on their door, warn them, don't come to hell. They were asking us to go. But you know what he said? Remember Abraham said, they're not going to believe that. They have Moses and the prophets. You know what? They have the Word of God. And that's what they got to believe. We have God's Word now. We don't have to have signs and wonders and miracles to confirm the message. We have the written Word of God. This is God's Word. They, they had those during this time with the apostles, but those signs and those miracles, not that God can't do miracles, He certainly does. But that's not a sign that the message is authentic. That they can... Uh, uh, you see a miracle that somebody comes in in a wheelchair and they start walking. Okay, Don't be deceived by miracles. Okay, When the Antichrist comes in the tribulation period, he'll deceive people by the means of the miracles that he's able to do. And so many people get caught up and mesmerized. And you can just, hey, you Google any of the miracle workers that you know on television. Just Google them sometime and say net worth and put the name in. They're multi, multi millionaires. People just sending their money. Oh, you send me a thousand dollars, that's your seed money, you're gonna get rich. No, you send them a thousand dollars, they're getting rich. That's what happens. I don't know how I got off on that, but there it went. <laughs> there it was. The choosing of the twelve, let's talk about that. Christ personally chose. 12. <clears throat> now, sometimes it's confusing as you read, the, read the, the gospel accounts and people get confused because they don't understand that the choosing that the Lord did happened in phases. Okay? And sometimes if you don't understand that, you, you, you can think the accounts contradict one another. But I think you'll see the stages of their calling. John chapter 1. Would you turn there please? John chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Beginning, <clears throat> verse number 35. Beginning in verse number 35. Are you there? Okay. John 1, verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. 
And two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they say unto him, Rabbi, which is to be, say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelled, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So, one of the two disciples of John, who once John announced the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, one of the first guys who left John and followed Jesus was Andrew. Okay? He'll be the first disciple we'll study next week, Okay, his life. And so there's Andrew. Notice what he did. Verse 41, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Here's the first phase of calling the first four of his disciples, but this was their calling to salvation. This was not their calling to be a disciple. This was their calling to salvation. Every disciple's first call is a call to salvation. You're not a disciple of Jesus Christ if you first do not believe in Him as your Savior. You first have to be, a, be saved. You have to have your faith in Jesus Christ in order to be a disciple. You have to recognize that He's the Lamb of God that died on the cross and shed His blood for your sins so you could have eternal life. So your sin debt would be paid for and you by faith in what His, his payment for you could be saved. So they're saved. They're listening to Jesus. They're, 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 they're listening to His teaching. But they kept their jobs they, didn't, they haven't left their jobs yet, okay? So their, their first phase was their calling to salvation. Their second phase was their call to service. Their call to service. For that, look at Luke chapter 5, would you please? Luke chapter 5. Verse 1, Luke 5, verse 1. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And in into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Simon answering, said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes that they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus saith unto Simon, Fear not, 
from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Now watch. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now they're walking away from the business. And, and understand, they're not walking away from business when the sales are down, things are bad. <laughs> they just took the biggest payday they'd ever have. Two ships full, ready to sink, full of fish. I mean, I'm sure they had to have somebody who said, man, you can't walk away from this. You can't walk, look at all this money. You're just going to walk away and follow this guy? I'm sure that wasn't a popular thing to do. But that was their call to service. And you think about it, Peter would have looked at that and said, man, when Jesus said, now, cast your net, go out in the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And they just fished all night and didn't get anything. I'm sure he's thinking, man, the timing's wrong, the place is wrong, I'm tired, I've been up all night, fine, to, to appease you, I'll let down a net. And boy, did Jesus get the best of him, didn't he? And you know what's great? When he saw the blessing of God, when he saw how much God, Jesus blessed him, it led him to repentance. He fell down at his knees and said, I'm a sinful man. He knew how wicked he was. You know, Romans 2 says it's the goodness of God that ought to lead men to repentance. You realize how good God's been to us. They forsook all and followed him. And from that point on, from this point on, they were inseparable from our Lord. They were always with him. Now, phase three of their calling is to their calling to the apostleship. That's Luke chapter 6, Luke 6, and verses 12 through 16. And that's where, again, Jesus went out to a mountain to pray in verse 12 and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, He called in Him His disciples, of whom He chose twelve, whom also He named apostles. And then it gives the list again that we've read before. So now he gives the calling to be apostles. And he chose 12 of them. And he's going to send them out, as we'll find out later, teamed up two by two to go out and preach the gospel. Let me give you the fourth phase. And that's we get that from Acts chapter 1, where the fourth time the list is mentioned. Now if you remember, this is Acts 1 takes place in the upper room after the ascension of Jesus. Jesus uh, rose from the dead and about 10 days later, Feast of Pentecost, well, I'm sorry, 40 days later, Jesus ascends to heaven. 10 days after the ascension, the Feast of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came down in power upon the upper room and those in the upper room. Jesus has ascended back to heaven. Now here they are waiting for the promise of the Father and they choose Matthias to take the place of Judas. But you have to understand, what is ahead for the apostles? You know what's ahead? Death. Martyrdom. Every, and you'll see that as we go through each one, we'll talk about how they died. But every single, time for somebody to wake up, uh, every single disciple Every single disciple, every single apostle died a martyr's death, save one. The only one that died of old age was John. And it wasn't for lack of effort. They, they tried to kill him. Uh, the, the, the history tells us they threw him in a cauldron of boiling oil and he didn't die. I don't know. I, I guess that's one of the things we'll have to see. You know, I... I don't know if he was just swimming around doing the backstroke or what, what he was doing, but they, they decided it's not doing any good. Let's get him out of there. I, we can't kill him. We'll exile him. And they exiled him to an isle called Patmos. But guess what? It's exactly where God wanted him to be. And that's where God gave him the revelation. The book of Revelation was written by John from the isle of Patmos. It's exactly what God wanted. And he died there on the Isle of Patmos. But these are real, 
living men that we identify with. Their faults and their failures as well as their triumphs are recorded in some of the most fascinating accounts you read in the Bible. These are, hey, these are men you want to know. They're fitting heroes and role models for us. I want to I want to know the men that were closest to Jesus when He walked on this earth. I want to know them. And the Spirit of God that transformed them is the same Spirit of God that can transform us. And we're going to learn from them what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to go over again to the book of Mark, would you please? And we'll take just five minutes here in closing. Mark chapter 3. Again, I want you to notice something. There was a twofold purpose in their calling. All right? Twofold purpose in their calling. And I want you to see this in Mark chapter 3. And notice verse number 14. And he ordained twelve. First of all, that they should be with him. What's the first reason that Jesus chose them? That they would be with Him. You know what that is? That's association. He wanted them to be with Him for fellowship. Isn't that what God had in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve? Wouldn't He come and walk with them in the cool of the day? And enjoy their fellowship? And wasn't, wasn't it when He came down to walk with them after they had sinned and He had to say, Adam! Adam! Where are you? Did God not know where he was? No, God knew where he was. But he wanted to hear from Adam, didn't he? But he couldn't fellowship with him anymore. Why? Sin had entered in. Sin had broken that fellowship with God. And he couldn't fellowship with him anymore. That's why the, the picture in Revelation 3 and verse number 20, Behold, I stand at the door and... If any man will open, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What's Jesus asking for? Fellowship. I want fellowship with you. I want to associate with you. I want, uh, that, that's what I, Jesus Christ said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who were lost. No, that which was lost. What's that? Fellowship. How can we restore fellowship with God? By trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior, His payment for our sin. You know what's restored? Fellowship with God. I can't fellowship with God if I'm not saved. I can't please God if I'm not saved. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way I can bring glory to God is to trust Christ as my Savior and begin to fellowship with Him. You need the presence of God, the fellowship with Jesus Christ in your life more than you need anything else. That's why when Mary sat at Jesus' feet, she, He told her she's chosen the needful part. You've got to have that. With Him to fellowship, with Him to learn. They're going to be taught by Him. Take my yoke upon me, Jesus said, and learn of me from meek and lowly of heart. You spend time alone with Christ and with us, that means time alone with the Bible and time alone in prayer, time alone quiet before God, listening to Him. Why? He'll instruct us. He'll teach us how to live life, how to handle our situations. How to deal with our relationships. How to have victory over our struggles and temptations. But you don't, you don't get any of that if you're not with Him. He ordained twelve that they'd be with Him for fellowship and for learning. If I'm going to serve Him effectively, serve Him the way He wants me to, I must spend time with Him and be instructed on how to do that. Secondly, he sent them forth to preach. 
We're not just association, but we're ambassadors for Christ. He sent them forth to preach. By the way, remember the apostle is one sent forth. And what are we sent forth to do? Preach. Preach what? The gospel. Don't go out and preach your convictions. Don't go out and preach your personal preferences. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone in a home and want to talk to somebody and, and they're smoking and they say, oh, is it okay if I smoke? I don't say, God bless you, that, that dirty, rotten, filthy habit, that tobacco stuff. No, I say, you know what, it's your house. I'm a guest in their home. They can do whatever they want in their house. I can cough and give the plan of salvation good as anybody. <laughs> but I'm going to tell them about Jesus. I'm there to preach the gospel. So preach the gospel to people. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we're sinners. We owe a payment for sin. Jesus Christ made the payment for us. You must by faith trust what He's done for you to give you eternal life, take you to heaven. Just, just preach the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll finish right there, okay? Put your tray tables in the upright position. We're going to be landing very soon. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Fellowship. Oh, but here's the ambassador. He hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you how by us we pray you in Christ's stead in place of Christ we're, we're begging you, be ye reconciled to God. How does that happen? He hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us when He knew no sin, when Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus became sin for us, and when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, His righteousness is put on your account. That's the news we get to take to people. Hey, you don't have to die and go to hell. You don't have to die and pay for your sins. Jesus Christ has done that. Good news, my friend. That's, that's, we get to go tell the good news. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. I was reading a statistic in a paper we got in the mail. They said, the, let me see if I can remember this. The Barna Group did a research and I think it said over 72%, I believe, of Americans believe that everybody has the Bible in their language. 72% of Americans believe everybody has a Bible in their language. When the truth of the matter is, 57% of the world does not have a complete Bible in their language. Yet 98% of Americans believe everybody ought to have access to a Bible. Well, if we believe everybody have access to a Bible, what are we doing? What are we doing about it? Then we ought to make sure that's going to happen, shouldn't we? Then why are we spending, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars on dog food every year? Sorry, dog lovers, cat lovers, ice cream lovers, you know, and we all do those things. 
Literally millions and millions and millions of dollars and we got a world that's dying and going to hell. Having millions, millions having never heard of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how horrible it would be the first time you ever hear the name of Jesus Christ and you're in hell? You can't do anything about it. Imagine that, how horrible it'd be. It, someone said how horrible it is to be lost. How horrible is it to be lost and know that no one's looking for you? There are millions in this world who are lost without Jesus Christ and nobody cares. Nobody cares. Just so we have everything we want to have. Thank God the disciples, you know, the early church, they got it. You remember? Remember the book of Acts, Pentecost, when the 3,000 got saved that day? Do you remember what they did? Those who had possessions, remember what they did? They sold it. Brought it to us here. Give it to people who need this. Man, they, they grasped right away, this world's not my home, I'm just passing through. Let's get the gospel to people. No wonder, no wonder they say, and the historians tell us that church may have grown to 60,000 people in about six months that had received Christ as their Savior and got baptized. They were pretty serious about it. Well, we're going to have a good time with the disciples of Jesus Christ, the apostles. Okay, First week, next week, first guy, Andrew. And a fascinating guy. And uh, more famous is his brother, Peter. But we'd never had Peter if Andrew hadn't have gotten him. And we'll talk about Andrew next Wednesday night. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's kind attention tonight. Thank you, Lord, for these 12 men that you chose. Lord, I'm looking forward to getting to know them and spend time with them over these next weeks. And Lord, I pray the folks will be looking forward to that as well. Lord, I pray that you'll dismiss us now with your care. Remind us of our association with you. That we're here to fellowship with you. We're here to learn from you. And then, Lord, help us to be sent forth by you to go and preach the gospel to a world that desperately needs to hear about Jesus Christ. Use us to be ambassadors for you throughout the remainder of this week. We love you. Dismiss us now with your care. In Jesus' name, amen.